go to the final story here. This is about uh, AOC choosing to go against policy. Before we get into that, if you haven't had a chance to do so, go ahead and smash that like button. And if you're new, don't forget to sub and share. AOC going against policy, someone who claims to be progressive. I keep telling you she's not. Someone who says that she's going to fight for progressive policies and progressive issues. Well, in a new interview with Jake Tapper, uh, yeah, Jake Tapper, in a new interview with Jake Tapper, you're actually going to see who AOC has actually been shaping up to be all along. I told you, I believe that she's trying to follow the path of Nancy Pelosi. And in order to do so, she's going to have to pull away from her progressive uh, policies and her progressive wing of the party. Remember, Nancy Pelosi, once upon a time, too, was for universal health care. And as time went by, she pulled away from some of those more progressive stances. So in this interview here, shout out to Case Study QB. You'll get to see what I think is the real AOC, which is who she's been shaping up to be. And what I think is going to is going to help her in her political career because she is not going to remain to be known as like this justice Democrat. She's starting to break away from that. And I could see her almost becoming like a female Hakeem Jeffries, where she starts to become part of the more establishment wing of the Democratic Party, but still using the phrase progressive, even though she's not supporting those policies. Pay attention to this. And joining us now is one of the most high profile members of the New York congressional delegation, Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, also known as AOC. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Uh, do we have the latest votes? We don't have those yet? Okay, so let me just go dive into the interview. So President Biden won this district by eight points in 2020. Uh, now, uh, Congressman, former Congressman Tom Suozzi, a Democrat, is trying to get it back. Um, but he's distanced himself from Biden. He didn't want his endorsement. He didn't want him to campaign with him. Do you think that's okay if that's what swing battleground uh, district Democrats need to do to win? Well, you know, I think we, our main prerogative is to win the House back. I know that Representative Swaz, former Representative Swazi, he knows his, his district, he knows his territory. But I also think we can acknowledge the fact that we don't have to be afraid to be Democrats either. As you mentioned, President Biden won this seat by eight points. That is not one or two or three. That is a significant margin. And we also can run up the numbers with an enormous amount of enthusiasm, especially in a, in a special election like this, which is really about a base race between the two parties, getting out your most enthusiastic voters, especially on a snowstorm like this. And, um, and that's with messages on everything from abortion rights to making sure that we're having just solutions and comprehensive solutions on immigration that don't also have to just be on the defense pause here. The race that they're talking about, this is the race that was George Santos uh, district. Uh, we talked about uh, Polite before. She's the woman that was a part of the IDF. Uh, I think I mentioned her to you. She's Ethiopian. She's very pro-Israel. She was an IDF soldier. Uh, and by the way, she lost. He did end up winning uh, that election. So uh, Pillip, uh, Mazi Pillip, the Republican running, mm -hmm. has tried to paint Swazi as a member of the squad, <laughs> which is your progressive uh, group. Uh, in their debate, Swazi distanced himself from, from you and the squad. He said, for you to suggest that I'm a member of the squad is about as believable as you being a member of George Santos's volleyball team, unquote. What do you, what do you make of, of her trying to tar him as a member of the squad? I, I mean, I I would agree with, with Tom Swazi, the idea that we are, you know, that we're are part of the same kind of cadre uh, in Congress is, incorrect, it's wrong, um, but that doesn't mean that we're not on the same team. Uh, we're part of a democratic coalition that's a broad base, but I think it also shows that Mozzie's desperate. Uh, you don't go for those enormous reaches that are frankly so laughable, especially to the people of Queens and Long Island who know Tom Swazi. He had 80% name ID going into this race. To claim something like that in a backyard that knows him is, it, it, it really shows that they're reaching um, and that they're pretty desperate to try to land a punch there. So notice what she said, pay attention to what she said, we're on the same team, right? So they all are part of the Democratic Party at the end of the day. And even the Republicans, they may be part of a different party, but at the end of the day, both parties are on the same team. That's for corporations, Wall Street, 
the military industrial complex, at the end of the day, they all are a part of the same team. The way he's been campaigning is he sounds like a conservative Queens or uh, Long Island Democrat. That's what he yeah. sounds like. He's, he yeah. sounds conservative on the border. Um, what do you make of that? And what do you make of the border issue as the last week has, has played out and Republicans originally demanded border be added to the foreign uh, aid bill and then they didn't want the border compromise? Mm -hmm that probably was too conservative for you, I would think. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now they're even rejecting to vote on the foreign aid bill. Just talk about the the border part of it and then we'll talk about foreign yeah. aid. Well, I mean, it's a, it, it, it's a gamble, but also this district is very complex. It's right here in our, in our backyard in New York City. You have a district that spans parts of New York City and Queens, but also reaches all the way out to Nassau County. There are parts of this district that are quite conservative and parts of this district that are very, very progressive. And so to be able to thread that needle and try to achieve turnout is, is a very challenging, uh, it, it's a very challenging you know, feat to, to be able to accomplish. Now, I do think that we need to be careful to not demobilize parts of the Democratic coalition, especially young voters, voters of color, um, because you have to run up your numbers in places like Queens in order to help um, buttress against any evenness in Nassau County. If the, the bill that passed the Senate early, early this morning, $95 billion to, for aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, if that were to be voted on in the House, mm -hmm. which is a big if, because it doesn't sound like the speaker if. wants to do it, but the Democratic leader, Hakeem Jeffries, your fellow New York Democrat, he wants that to come to the floor. If it came to the floor, would you vote for it? I, I don't think I could bring myself to vote for it. I think that the provisions in the bill from not just the border, or not just uh, uh, the provisions that we see across the board, but especially when it comes to foreign aid, the- Pause for a second, because I wanna explain what she means by not voting for the bill. Remember, AOC has been known to do this before, where instead of voting yes or no on the bill, she'll just vote present, right? Remember, she did that in reference to the Iron Dome when her vote actually could have made a difference. Remember, we talked about that before on this show. Wow, it's, I can't believe I'm like my third year of the show. But we talked about that before on the show where I said like the squad votes in reference to the Iron Dome actually could have made a difference and they chose not to do so. Same thing with the Capitol Police uh, bill their votes actually could have made a difference. And of course they chose not to do so. So just because she says she's not gonna vote for it, that doesn't mean she's gonna vote against it either. Sometimes some of these politicians will vote present to kind of save face. So that way they can say, well, I didn't vote for it and I didn't vote against it. And that way she, they can kind of remain you know, safe in Congress with their colleagues. So that way they're not shunned and they're still considered to be part of the, the team, so to speak. It's one of those tactics that they use every now and then. Rashida Tlaib has done it before as well. The increased restrictions on UNRWA funding, the UN refugee uh, assistance funding, the complete lack of humanitarian aid, especially on the heels of, of this invasion on Rafa. I think we are at a point where we have to do something to protect innocent people, innocent lives of Palestinians in Gaza. And I'm very concerned about the Netanyahu, the Netanyahu administration's lack of restraint and their stated intent and lack of regard for, for saving innocent lives. I asked, so Let me pause here for a second, because once again, what did I tell you guys? It's really easy to call out Netanyahu. Like I've called out Netanyahu, most people who are either left leaning or to the left or whatever you want to call socialist progressive most people can easily call out netanyahu what is more difficult though is to call out zionism within itself because without zionism you don't get a netanyahu you see what i mean guys like instead of just pointing to that one person sometimes you have to look at where the creation of that person and that ideology actually came from. So without Zionism, you don't have a Netanyahu and his rhetoric and his hatred for the Palestinian people. Without Zionism, you don't have a Ben Shapiro. You don't have a Michael Rappaport. You don't have these horrible statements from Zionists like their self. 
So you have to look at the ideology as a whole. You can't just point fingers at Benjamin Netanyahu, just like I can't just point fingers at Joe Biden or Donald Trump. I have to point fingers at the system that created those people in the first damn place, a system that is owned by the billionaire class. And the 99% are at the bottom. So that's the important part and push back on people. When you see people take that easy road and say Netanyahu is far right wing and very dangerous, make sure you bring it back to the core issue, which is Zionism, which is supremacy. That is the problem. Senator Chris Coons about uh, the foreign aid bill and I, I'm going by memory here. Uh, I'm not 81, but my memory isn't always perfect. And uh, I think he said that there was $10 billion in aid for humanitarian aid for Gaza. We'd have to see, but as it stands, the, the UNRWA is the number one central corridor for humanitarian assistance to enter, uh, to enter Gaza. And so to see how it would be structured, you know, this is something that is, I think, of prime concern. And to also block off the main corridor, corridor of humanitarian aid is a major, major move um, from the US Congress, especially that it's predicated on allegations that are still being investigated. But as those investigations continue to go on, the basis of them uh, do seem to be eroding. And so we have to ask ourselves, mm -hmm. why? Why would we do that? So, um so let me just make something very clear here, okay? Talking about sending aid to Gaza is a mute point if Israel is preventing the aid from getting to the Palestinian people. You see what I mean? You're just, you're basically throwing money away at this point in time. What should happen is that Israel should not be allowed to block the aid from coming in. So you're throwing money out the window every time the US government says, we're gonna send this much aid to Palestinians in Gaza. None of that matters if Israel is preventing the food and the medicine and other supplies from getting to the Palestinian people. Or if Israel, and I've seen videos of this too, when the Palestinians that are in Rafa are trying to go to get supplies or food, the IDF shoots them. So you sending aid to people that have basically just become targets for racist Zionists is a mute point. It's a mute point. If they can't get the food and they can't get the supplies and that needs to be called out too. So for all the people, again, let's talk about the easy road and let's talk about the difficult road. It is easy to say we need to give food and aid to the Palestinian people in Gaza right now because kids are starving there. That's the easy thing to say. It is more difficult to point out the fact that the reason why they're not receiving the aid that has been sent is because Israel is blocking it. I've seen all kinds of videos and kinds of pictures. They're setting the food on fire, all this kinds of stuff. And I consider that to be a war crime. But once again, Israel is not held accountable. And I really, really worry about this. I'm telling you, if Israel continues to go unchecked, there will be no stopping them, regardless who the population is. Doesn't have to be Palestinians next time. Next time it could be someone else. Before you go, uh, there have been a lot of questions, especially since that special counsel report last week that cleared uh, President Biden of any wrongdoing legally, but certainly impugned uh, his memory. Mm -hmm. And this come, that came on the heels of just a few days before him uh, talking about conversations he had in 2021 with world leaders who had died several years before that. He was mm -hmm. confusing world leaders. Tom Swazi uh, told a local news station when this question was raised about Biden, quote, the bottom line is he's old. I mean, he's 81 years old. Um, he wouldn't say, Swazi, whether Biden would be the Democratic nominee at the party convention in August. Um, do you have any concerns about his age? Do you have any concerns about whether or not he should be the nominee? I mean, I think right now when it comes to the president's age folks are talking about how he's 81 but we have to look at first of all donald trump is 
around the same age as 77, yeah. He's 77 years old. They could have. Now, this is where AOC is being disingenuous. First of all, she knows what we're talking about. She knows damn well what Jake Tapper is referring to when he mentions his age. He's not referring to his chronological age. He's referring to his mental acuity, which AOC is very much well aware of. So why is she sitting here pretending like it's just about the number, right? You see this? So let me tell you something. I believe AOC has been made some, pro some promises have been made to her. And I believe those promises may have been made probably around the time of force the vote. Because that's when I started to see changes from her. Like I said, when she first went in, she was protesting outside of Nancy Pelosi's office. I believe there have been some backroom deals that have been made specifically to AOC. I can't speak for other members of the squad, but specifically for her because she was the most popular squad member. And I believe that what she has been offered is to further her political career, even if it means running for president at some point. I could actually see her doing that. Don't know if she would win, but I could actually see her doing that. And I believe that she has been offered some type of political career advancement to go along more with the establishment part of the party, which is the majority of the party. And what they probably said to her is, you'll be able to still keep some of the progressivism that you want. Like for example, you still wanna maintain a hold, some type of hold on your progressive base, the people who came out to support, support you the first time around. So on certain issues, it'll be okay for you to speak in a progressive way. But on other issues, we're gonna need you to move over to the establishment side. And of course, one of those issues I would imagine has probably been that regardless who the Democrat presidential candidate is, whether it's a progressive or it is the Dem establishment shill, you will support the Democrat nominee. And I say that because Remember, she endorsed Bernie Sanders in 2020. I believe that is what has happened. And I believe that AOC decided that her political career was more important to her than her integrity. And I also believe that if she were to go on to any of these left independent media shows, if she went back onto Glenn Greenwald's show, if she went back onto Jimmy Dore's show, if she even went on to TYT, hell, they would be easier. They would be easier on her. I believe this would be called out to her. And I believe that's why you do not see her appear onto left independent media. Let's let her finish here gone to high school together. And beyond that, Donald Trump has 91 indictments and what I know who I'm going to choose is going to be the one of the most successful presidents in, in modern American history that plat, that passed the Inflation Reduction Act, that got us the American Rescue Plan, that ensured that we could pass one of the largest federal investments in climate change in U.S. history. And let me pause for a second. See, let me tell you how she she trying to play people. Let's go back to when she talks about what he passed. Seven years old, they could have gone to high school together. And beyond that, Donald Trump has 91 indictments. And what I know who I'm going to choose is going to be the one of the most successful presidents in, in modern American history that plat, that passed the Inflation Reduction Act, that got us the American Rescue Plan, that ensured that we could pass one of the largest federal investments in climate change in U.S. Pause. See, the climate change piece is what really gets her into trouble. This is how she shows you that she's full of shit. Because AOC knows that even though that climate legislation passed, that Joe Biden is still fracking with the Willow Project. That's off the coast, whoops, that's off the coast of Alaska and also off the coast of Texas, he's also drilling there too. So AOC knows that Joe Biden is still approving projects that are actually still going to cause harm to the climate. She knows that. 
And two, when she says he passed these pieces of legislation, those pieces of legislation passed in Congress first. You see, this is the part that people, a lot of times we talk about the president, but who we put into the House of Representatives and the Senate actually matters even more because legislation is passed in the House first, then it moves on to the Senate, then the Senate passes the legislation and then the president signs it. So all Joe Biden did was sign the legislation but it was the House and the Senate that passed the legislation for it even to reach his desk for him to sign it. She's talking about this as though he did this by executive order, which he did not. That's why I say she's being disingenuous. Let's let her continue here. History, and as far as we go, as we know, uh, virtually all the filing deadline, deadlines have passed. There's already been a primary. Voters have outright rejected Dean Phillips. President Biden is going to be the Democratic nominee and hopefully. Have voters out, out, listen to what she's saying. Voters have outright rejected Dean Phillips. She didn't say that about Bernie Sanders. When Bernie Sanders was still running in 2020 in the Dem primary, after Joe Biden won South Carolina, she didn't say that about Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders stayed in through Super Tuesday and a little bit beyond that. She sounds like Nancy Pelosi. She sounds like Simone Sanders. She sounds like she's one of them. Ay, ay, ay rejected Dean Phillips, President Biden is going to be the Democratic nominee and hopefully he'll be reelected as president of the United States. Are you worried about at all about these challenges from the left, Jill Stein, Cornell West? I don't know where RFK of, Jr. is, not, whether he's left, right or center, but, but there is a real fear that they could take votes away from Biden. And that is real. Look at her, before we get to her answer, I'm gonna mute this for a second. I want you to pay attention to her body language. Watch this. So this is the part where he asks, are you worried? You see that? Look at her body language. So you know what that is, right? She's annoyed by that question, but she has to answer that question. Junior is whether he's left, right or center, but, but there is a real fear that they could take votes away from Biden. And that is real, that is real, especially in states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, critical swing states. Um, but we need to understand what we are staring down in this country. If Donald Trump is elected president of the United States, we do not know if there will be a verifiable next election that has integrity. He already tried to. So a verifiable election, in other words, democracy to AOC is more important than genocide. You see how she talks out both sides of her mouth? This is what I was telling you before. They told her, you can be progressive on some things. Like you can call out what's happening to the Palestinian people. You can do that, but you still got to get out there and promote Joe Biden. One of the reasons why we have not had a strong third party movement in this country. Yes, there's the issue with ranked choice voting. I talked about that before on the show. But the other reason is because people who actually have the platform and the power and the base to mobilize a lot of people to support those candidates, chicken out and choose to back the establishment. So when I titled this story in the stream, AOC omits policy, what it's trying to show you is this. I don't vote for a person. I'm voting for the policies. So if you call yourself a progressive, you should be supporting the candidate that represents those policies and has the platform to do so. What AOC is doing is she's telling you that the genocide is wrong and we need a ceasefire and there needs to be some type of self-determination for the Palestinian people. But she is telling you to vote and support for the person who is aiding and approving and allowing the genocide to happen. And this is not to say that Trump would be any different either, because both of these presidents back and support Israel. Trump was the one who actually moved the Capitol. Remember that? 
So the point is AOC with the base and the platform that she has, she alone could be enough to mobilize all these young people and get them to go out there and support the third party independent candidates that are running correctly on progressive issues and have the right message and strategy when it comes to Gaza. But she is not going to do that because she wants to be a careerist. And that's how this works, ladies and gentlemen. That's how you get to keep your seat in DC. You kiss a lot of people's ass, you bend the knee when they tell you to, and you abandon your principles. And that is what has happened to AOC. AOC knows that Joe Biden is not the best president. AOC knows that this man does not have the mental acuity to have a reelection. But I also wouldn't be surprised if she also knows that they're going to swap someone else in as well. It's a fraud. And if I were you, if I lived in her district and I donated money to her campaign, I would contact her team and ask for a refund. In fact, I think everybody should do that. I think everyone should do that. If you live in these districts of the squad members and you take issue with the way that they've been voting on policy and you feel like you were robbed, and they did you wrong, especially if you gave your last, you should contact their team and ask for a refund. They got receipts. I encourage everybody to do that. That's something you can actually do. Contact the team and ask for a refund. Maybe if enough people did that in reference to these politicians failing the American people, their constituents that supported them and donated to them, maybe they can get their act straight. She'll finish here. We saw on January 6th, he tried to overturn the results of a presidential election by force, by inciting a riot. And I, you know, I think we need to be very, very realistic about the grave, grave impacts of a Donald Trump election. It is not a joke. It is not a game. We need to protect our democracy. And ideally, it's going to be on progressive values. Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria. Con you see that we need to protect our democracy saying the same talking points as Nancy Pelosi, Hakeem Jeffries, the establishment Democrats, AOC is gone. And I tried to tell people about this, like, what's it been two years now, two years ago, because I saw where she was heading right after force the vote. And I saw how she was voting on legislation. And I said, look, she's going out that way. She's going out the door. And a lot of people continue to try to defend AOC I don't know why. I guess these people are trying to get her to come on their show. Don't know. But I wasn't. Maybe that's the difference. I never contacted her team. I never invited her on my show. Maybe that's the difference. I actually wasn't trying to get access to her.